गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी माई सेल्फ जिमिश पाठक एंड विथ मी इज माई कलीग मिस्टर यासीन मंसूरी एंड वी आर फ्रॉम द श्रीमती एस एम पंचाल साइंस कॉलेज माइक्रोबायोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट टूडे द टॉपिक ऑफ आवर डिस्कशन इज द रेगुलेशन ऑफ लाइसोजेनी सो द बेजिक द ओवरऑल कंटेन्ट्स ऑफ अवर टॉपिक तो मित्रों ते जी सको स्लाइड पर दिस इज दी नेम ऑफ द टॉपिक विच वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस टूडे रेग्युलेशन ऑफ लाइसोजेनी नेक्स्ट प्लीज सर द अवर टॉपिक मेनली इन्क्लूड्स द फॉलोइंग डिटेल्स दिस डिटेल्स आर दी बैक्ट्रोफाजिस इट मेनली इन्क्लूड्स इट्स डेफिनेशन structure of bacteriophages its various types and how such bacteriophages are discovered it also includes various stages of its life cycle of bacteriophages like the lysis the another important stage which is the main focus of our discussion is the lysogeny and then some of the important events which are related with this lysogeny are the induction and another event immunity the other contents which are related mainly to our topic is the regulation so it mainly depends on the genetic organization and the gene arrangements so it includes the genome various components of this genomes and the structure of the typical bacteriophage genome also we'll discuss what is the genetic network means how the various genes of bacteriophages are interacted with each other and ultimately the main topic of our discussion how together all these genes can regulate the process of lysogeny so and at the last we'll discuss the references which we have included for our two days discussion so first of all before we learn the concept of lysogeny though it is observed basically in the bacteriophage viruses so first we should have an idea what is a bacteriophage so as you can see on the slide phage is a virus and the word phage comes from a greek word phage in means to eat so bacteriophage are the phages that multiply inside any bacteria by making or use of some or even all the host biosynthetic machinery now examples which are the main examples of such bacteriophages so basically it includes the lambda phage where is t family of phages so like t2 t4 t7 and ms2 these are the some of the examples of typical bacteriophages now we must have an idea regarding the structure of a lambda phage so lambda phage is a typical bacteriophage and its structure is like this so basically as you can see on the screen the structure is mainly composed of the various parts like the head then it is connected with the tail and with the help of a component which is known as collar the tail at the end of or at the base of this tail it is composed of various tail fibers which helps any bacteriophage to attach with this host surface or we can say at the cell wall of any bacterium the head mainly contains these regulatory machineries means the dna in case of dna viruses and in case of rna the head mainly contains the rna as nucleic acid material of viruses so overall the head tail 
and base plate is the basic structure of any typical lambda phage or a bacteriophage next please now on the base of its life cycle viruses are mainly showing two types of their growth pattern so on the base of that this bacteriophages can be divided into two parts one which is known as the temperate phage and the typical example of such temperate phage is the lambda phage so now what is the meaning of this temperate means the, these are the phages that can be transmitted from cell to cell by infection or passed from mother cell to daughter cell without damaging the host cell wherein the phage either exists in a latent or in a quiescent form. So such type of phages are known as temperate phages. Now on the contrary the other type of the bacteriophage is known as virulent phages and the example of such typical virulent phages is lambda phage as well as the T phages now what is the difference so here they can cause host cell to lies means the host bacterial cell is broken open or we can say lysed and destroyed after immediate replication of viruses so such type of viruses or bacteriophages are known as virulent phages now we must have idea what how such viruses or bacteriophages were first discovered means the role of the various eminent scientists who gave their contribution in the discovery of such bacteriophages so first of all in in the very past in year around 1896 the scientist like Hanbury Hankin so they reported that something in the water of the river Ganga and Yamuna is capable of treating the diseases like cholera means they have some antibacterial activity but they were failed to found that object that component because even that component was so small that can easily pass through the filter of porcelain but they have some idea that something is there in the water of these rivers that can cure this cholera and which shows antibacterial activity in the discovery the contribution of other scientists is the very known scientist Frederick Twart he was the superintendent in the Brown Institute of London and who discovered that some small agents that infect and kill bacteria but at that time the research or we can say the facilities were not available to show that object who can infect and kill bacteria but they have some idea that something some agent is there which is capable to cause infection even in the bacteria next please okay then the main scientist of the discovery who was a French Canadian microbiologist Felix D. Harrell who was working in the very famous Pasteur Institute of Paris who announced the very important facts regarding the bacteriophages and the viruses and he declared that he had discovered an invisible antagonistic microbe which is found in the dysentery bacillus means the bacillus which caused the dysentery and who found some of the evidences of the presence of that viruses in such dysentery bacillus and at the end another scientist mainly the group of scientists means the Delbruck, Hershey and Salvador Luria and they have performed very vigorous work on the identification and 
on the discovery of viruses and they were awarded the even Nobel Prize for their discoveries for the replication of viruses and its genetic structure. So basically all the scientists well, were gave their efforts in the discovery of viruses. Now the our main topic is the regulation of lysogeny. So before we start this lysogeny we must have some knowledge regarding the important terms which we'll discuss or we will use continuously in the next term. So such important terms are as shown in the figure. The first term of importance is the prophage. Now what is this prophage? Means the phage genome integrated into the host bacterial genome is prophage means it is a part of the genome of phage which reacts or interacts with the host bacterial cell so this interacted phage genome with bacterial genome is known as prophage this as you can see the figure on your screen the red line shows the structure or the prophage and the second black line indicates the host genome. The another second important term is the lysogen. Now what is lysogen? So any bacterium which carries the prophage is called lysogen means bacteria. It is a bacterium which carries the bacteriophage and that is ultimately known as a lysogen. Next please okay so this lysogens are also means once any bacterial cell is inf infected with this type of bacteriophage then it will become immune to further infection by the similar type of phage because their functions are repressed means once a bacterial cell is infected with a single type of bacteriophage then that same bacterial cell cannot be infected with the similar type of phages. Next please. The another important factors as we have seen basically the life cycle of this bacteriophage is mainly divided in two parts either it will choose the lysis portion or it will choose the lysogeny for its survival and multiplication. So we will start with its life cycle with these two parts. First portion is known as the lysis or lytic cycle. The first step of this lysis is the attachment of that bacteriophage on the surface of a typical bacterial host cell. Then the next step as you can see in the figure indicated with the red line that is the genome of bacteriophage which penetrates inside the host cell and this linear genome is now circularized and then the whole bacteriophage will detach from the host bacterial cell. Now this circularized DNA or the genome of bacteriophage is again using the synthetic machinery of the host cells means it will take up all the control from the host genome and start synthesizing its own machinery. So this step is known as the replication of that viruses then multi assembly of various parts of that viruses like that head, tail, base plates and after the assembly they will form multiple copies or the hundreds of copies of viruses inside the host and once that number of viruses reaches to the definite number they will, they will create tremendous pressure on the host cell and lies that cell wall. So that last step is actually known as the lysis. So overall this lysis process involves as we can see in the figure the attachment, penetration, 
circularization of the genome and then replication, assembly, multiplication and the release of that viruses from the host cell. The second important part of its life cycle is the lysogeny. So here also the first step of lysogeny is very much similar with that lysis means the attachment of the bacteriophage to the surface of the bacterial cell or to the host cell then the penetration of that whole, uh, phage genome inside that bacterial host once again the circularization of that phage genome inside the host cells and detachment of that bacteriophage from the their surface then now these steps in this that far genome now instead of taking of the control of the bacterial host genome it will attaches to the host genome means it will with the help of various enzymes like integrase enzymes it will attaches with the host genome so this is what the term we have discussed earlier prophage formation is occur then once the prophage is produced it can capable of replicating itself with the host cell means this prophage will move from mother cell to the daughter cell with host genome without get separated from that host bacterial cell and ultimately though it is transformed from mother cell to daughter cell it will not cause the lysis of the host genome so this is what is known as the lysogeny process so this is the basic difference between these two the same process of lysogeny is we can see in form of a linear DNA so the blue line which you are observing on your screen is showing the structure of this bacterial DNA the basic attachment sites is in between the two operons that is galactose and biotin operon and the circular black line you are observing is the genome of this bacteriophage it is having a repressure and due to the presence of that repressure protein actually it will go for the lysogeny instead of lytic cycle so this will integrate with the host cell with the help of integrase enzyme between the galactose and biotin operon so ultimately this step provides the formation of lysogeny and then it will replicate with the host DNA so that is what is passive replication of bacteriophage the same figure or the same event is observed in form of double stranded DNA where we can even observe the joining then the cutting and the basic recombination means the optional genes will uh, attach with each other and they form the lambda prophage structure as you can see on the screen now the important events which can affect the stability of lysogeny is the induction process so what is induction so all we know the prophage it is a lysogenic state of the bacterial host with the bacteriophage genome so now induction is the one type of effect when any stressed condition or we can say the exposure of UV cells to the prophage means if the prophage is there and it is exposed to the UV light then it will cause once again the recircularization of that bacteriophage genome from the host cell means it will start starting get separated from that host cells and once it is circularized it will start or it will take up the whole control from the host cell 
and starts its own replication, assembly and multiplication of cells and once the number of cells are formed they will break up the cell wall of the host and they will cause the release means the lysis so induction is ultimately the process of conversion of prophage form or the lysogenic state of the bacteria into the lytic state of that bacteria now so overall excision lytic growth progeny formation and ultimately lysis so as you can see on the screen this is shown in terms of genetic evidences so first we are observing the repressure fragment of prophage then it is exposed once it is exposed with uv light the circularization of that genome take place and once it is circularizing the enzyme axisanase cuts it from the host genome and that host genome will get separated and once again the free form of bacteriophage will take up all the control from such bacteriophage and starts its own replication which will ultimately leads to the formation of progeny and causes the lysis of the host cells so these are the typical steps of induction excision lytic growth progeny formation and lysis another important event which is related with lysogeny is called immunity so what is immunity so as you can see on the screen this is the structure of prophage so once it is if suppose any it is infected with a bacteriophage and other lambda phage comes from outside then it is not capable of causing any infection to the already infected host cells means if one bacterium cell is already infected with lambda phage then other lambda phage similar type of other lambda phage cannot infect the same host and it cannot get replicated or infected so this phenomenon is known as the immunity of that host cells from the infection by second or other type of bacteriophages now though the our main topic of today's discussion is the regulation of lysogeny so we must have some basic idea regarding the overall genetic structure of this bacteriophages so as you can see on the screen this figure shows the overall gene organization or we can say the genetic map of typical lambda bacteriophage so at the bottom there are the genes structural genes which are mainly about the head and tail genes then the on the left you can see the genes of recombination same way on the right hand side you can observe the genes which are responsible for the replication and in between these genes of recombination and replications you can find the various gene region like the c1 c2 n cro q these are known as the regulatory region and near the replication region also you can find the region of genes which is responsible to cause lysis so all this region now we are going to see all these regions in a linear form so this is the same figure which is shown in a linear form and which shows how this typical genes are arranged so basically overall the far genome are 30 genes and their length or the size is around 48502 base pair long and that can actually cause the life cycle of a typical bacterial phage now we'll see some of the details how these various groups of genes work so first we'll start with the genes which are called the head 
and tail genes means this code for the structural proteins of the bacteriophage capsid as well as the terminase enzyme required to process rolling circle multimers into the unit genome length pieces during packaging means the head and tail formation as well as its packaging material then these are some of the genes means the examples of various genes which involved into the head and tail assembly the next the important group is known as the recombination genes so mainly which codes for the int or xis which are required for either int for integration of the bacteriophage into the bacterial host chromosome during the lysogenic growth and XIS is responsible for the excision from the bacterial host chromosome during that induction process. Some of the examples of such recombinant or the genes required for recombination are as shown in the screen. The next important group which will be later discussed in more detail is the group of regulation region so this includes the immunity region as well as the genes that are responsible for the controlling the switch between the lysogenic and lytic growth means the important is that q antiterminator protein which is produced or it, it is the product of q gene as well as the anti q rna and PR dash constitute a second regulation region. So these are the basic some of the important examples of regulatory genes which you can observe on the screen like the N which mainly affects on the early gene transcription then Rex B, Rex A and most important one are the C1, CRO, C2 and REN. These are some of the genes which are having no definite role during the regulation. They are observed in the regulatory region, but their role, their definite role, is still unknown. And ultimately, the replication region mainly includes just two replication products, O and P, that is the origin of the replication and finally there are four genes in the lysis region which are responsible to cause the host lysis that are ORF64, S, R and RZ genes. So these are the basically basic composition and the gene organization of the typical lambda bacteriophages. Though the our main topic of concern is the lysogeny and its regulation. Now that will be further discussed by my colleague Mr. Yasin Mansuri and he will continue this topic or discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning viewers. It's a pleasure to be here to be part of the whole event of BISAC and I take this opportunity to thank all the staff involved, all the persons involved in achieving this great adventure and this great target of teaching the students all across the Gujarat in this beautiful program. Now let me continue my topic of discussion, our topic of discussion that is the regulation of lysogeny. As my colleague discussed all those genes, this is just a tabular form of the genes starting from N which is an antitermination protein the whole tra transcription begins with the role of the N and the CRO, which is listed below. Apart from this, there are O genes, the P genes, which are initiation of the lambda DNA replication, the Q gene, which is again an antitermination protein, the C1 molecule, the most important molecule of regulation, that is C1 repressor, it's a repressor protein. The C2 and C3 are helping C1 to work, and they are activators and stabilizers, respectively. The CRO which is a protein which inhibits C1 synthesis, the GAM, which is required for the rolling replication, rolling circle replication, the red gene, which is involved in the recombination, the integrase gene, as my colleague previously mentioned, is the gene for the integration, the formation of lysogeny, 
and the excess gene which is for the conversion of the lysogeny to the lytic that is the excess enzyme. Now as you can see further the same map including the most important genes that are part of this regulation that is the integrase, the C3, the NC1. Among these the three genes that are specifically required for controlling the lysogenic pathway are the lambda C1 gene, C2 and the C3 gene. So the whole network begins with the early gene expression in which the promoter left and the promoter right are transcribed and this transcription leads to the expression of the N and the CRO. So as you can see in this flow that promoter left and promoter right are transcribing the N gene and the CRO gene. Now this N gene and the CRO gene transcription begins the transcription and determination function by the N. So this leads to the expression of the C3, C2 and the Q genes. So as you can see here the N has transcribed itself into C2, C3 and the, C and the Q gene. Now, additional regulatory steps of this network is that the N is autoregulated by a negative feedback loop, some sort of feedback inhibition. The CRO represses expression from the PL and PR promoters and the same CRO is also negatively repressed by a negative feedback loop. Now as you can see here the negative feedback loop of N and the CRO are visible in this slide. Now the lysogenic pathway begins with the C function of the C2 and C3. The function of C3 is to stabilize the rapidly degrading C2. The C2 is actually getting degraded by HF1 protease. But the C3 stabilizes this degradation and thus the C2 gets activated and it activates the product that is the integrase enzyme. The other function of C2 is to activate the C1 synthesis. The C1 repressor, that is the C1 protein, it represses the promoter left and the promoter right. And C1 autoregulates its expression from promoter repressor maintenance, that is PM or PRM. As you can see these steps here, that is the functioning of the C3 and the C2 with the blue lines on PL and PE and integrase and apart from that PE that is pre, uh, promoter ex establishment it is promoter repressor establishment PE which has a function on the C1 which is visible on the left corner of the screen. Now the C1 because it is a very important molecule it is further discussed that is C1 repressor the protein the C1 repressor protein is made up of two monomers that is it is a dimer which is connected by a connector molecule. So the C1 repressor is made up of 27 kilo Daltons molecular weight. It has two distinct domains that is the N terminal domain which is having a residue from 1 to 92 which provides the operator binding site. The next the second monomer that is a C terminal domain it is having it is from the 132 to 236 amino acids and it is responsible for the dimerization. These two molecules are connected by a connector molecule which is having a 40 residue. So when this repressor is digested by any protease or by a protease, this each domains are released as a separate fragment that is the C and the N. Now the second important molecule of this whole story is the CRO. The structure of the CRO is that CRO is a dimer that is it has it is a monomer having 66 amino acids that are linked this is the structure of the CRO now this main the main point that is regulation the regulation begins with as I mentioned earlier the C2 and the C3 the gene product of C2 and the C3 they bind with the PRE and activate PRE PRE is the promoter for repressor establishment. So this binding with the promoter repressor establishment has an effect on the C1 gene. 
that is the activated PRE facilitates the transcription of the C1 gene and thus C1 repressor is produced, the central molecule of the whole phenomenon. Now this C1 repressor has two functions. First, it binds with the PRM. PRM is the promoter for repressor maintenance and thus it activates this promoter. So the PRM ensures the continuous synthesis of C1 repressor as you can see in the slide in the flow. The second function of the C1 repressor is that it binds with the operator promoter left and operator promoter right and thus it inactivates both these promoters. So this will stop the transcription of FARGE structural genes that is the transcription of the FARGE structural genes will be inhibited. So this, this the C1 repressor does not allow the replication of the lambda FARGE DNA to occur. This favors the lysogenization. So that is how the C1 repressor has a very profound effect on the lysogenization. Now, once this lysogenization is induced by some UV rays, there comes the role of the second molecule, important molecule of CRO. Now, for the transcription of the FARGE structural genes, the CRO gene product is required. GP stands for gene product. So this CRO protein, it binds with the repressor maintenance, that is PRM, and inactivates it. So this will stop the synthesis of C1 repressor. So once the C1 repressor is stopped, the transcription start begins. Now the CRO protein also has a positive effect on the operator promoter left and operator promoter right. So the structural genes associated with these promoters, this gets, they start getting transcribed. And this will lead to the lytic development. So this covers the point of lysogeny and then the lysis and we can see here how C1 repressor when it is absent there is no negative effect on the operator promoter left and right and when CRO is present there is a positive effect on the operators and thus the lytic development begins. Now some questions arise during this discussion that because the lambda has the option of both lysogeny and lysis how does it decide right so there are some questions that need to be answered the first question is that how does the infected cell the infected bacterial cell decide to become lysogenic rather than to enter the productive cycle or that is the lytic cycle the second question is how does the lysogenic condition get maintained into the infected cell now the answers to these questions depend on two things the first is that that is before we begin the discussion of the answers we must understand that the infected cell undergoes a decision between the two alternative pathways that is the lytic pathway or the lysogenic pathway now in those cells which are rich that is sufficiently nutrients are present then in such cells there is a high protease activity this high protease activity leads to the breakdown of the C2 so this will lead to the lytic life cycle. Now in those cells with limited nutrients, the protease activity is low, making the C2 stable. So this will lead to the lysogenic lifestyle. So it is the condition of the nutrients that affects the lysogeny or the lytic. If there is high nutrients, then lytic. If there are low nutrients, then lysogeny. So if the lysogeny is followed, if the latter, that is lysogeny is followed, the state becomes stable, it becomes established, it becomes maintained. While this state is highly stable, it can switch from the lytic path to the lytic pathway in the pro process of prophage induction that we have already early seen earlier. Now this induction, as we know, is due to some UV exposure which occurs when due to the, uh, due to the host SOS response which is triggered by the DNA damage due to the UV exposure. So it is the UV exposure that converts the, the lysogenic state into the lytic state. Now this whole story is again put forward in a, in a single uh, flow diagram. 
how there is a bistable switch this bistable switch consists of as I mentioned earlier the crow and the C1 as you can see in the first line that is if the crow is off and if the C1 is on this will lead to the lysogeny or if the crow is on and this C1 is off this will lead to the lysis so this covers the whole story of the lysogeny and the lysis and with this we end the discussion and the references used during this discussion that is a very good book from a genetic switch gene control and phage lambda from Tashne the general virology by Luria Campbell and Bartimol Darnell and the last that is rock biology of microorganisms by Medigan M.T. Martinko J.M. and Parker J. So this completes our discussion of regulation of the lysogeny. And thus, I hope the viewers are now clear with the regulation of lysogeny. If there are any questions from the viewers, we can all discuss that. And we can continue our discussion for a few minutes.